Brittany Beers lived in Sturgis, Michigan with her mother, Tina Stetler, and uncle, James Beers. Six years old at the time, Brittany had begun attending school and had a love of art and exploration. Described as a tomboy, the youngster could often be found outside playing until she was called in for dinner. Like many children her age, Brittany was quite timid and extremely fearful of strangers. Brittany had a stepsister, Dixie, who lived with their biological father. Despite the distance, the two young girls were extremely close. On September 16, 1997, Brittany walked out of her home at the Village Manor Apartments wearing a white top with a floral design, pink tie-dyed shorts, white sneakers with a pink logo on the side, and shoelaces with a red stripe. At approximately 7.30 p.m., the six-year-old headed out with plans to ride her bike around the neighborhood. Just an hour later, her mother Tina went to run some errands and saw Brittany riding her bike. According to Brittany's half-brother, he then saw the six-year-old sitting on a bench just moments after Tina left. Tina returned home at 9.05 p.m. and told Brittany's brother to bring his sister home for the night, but she was nowhere to be found. After frantically searching for the young girl, at 10.30 p.m., Tina placed a call to the police, who arrived on the scene and began their investigation. The apartment complex was located on U.S. Route 12, a main road that saw a lot of traffic every day, making authorities worry that the girl could have been snatched and taken far away. Brittany's bike was found shortly after the investigation began, but that was all that was ever found. Much of the early search focused on a 40-acre stretch of land that Brittany was known to play in frequently. A witness living nearby reported to police that he had seen Brittany between 8.30 and 9 p.m. According to him, Brittany was speaking with an unidentified man driving a brown or dark red car. The witness later explained that Brittany told him she'd made a new friend, though this was the last time he saw the young girl. A composite sketch was created based on the witness's description, depicting a dark-haired man with a thick mustache, speculated to have been in his late 20s or early 30s. The composite was posted around town and shown to neighbors, but no one recognized the man, and it is unknown if he was even involved in Brittany's abduction. Brittany's siblings were removed from their home the following year after accusations of physical and sexual abuse were levied against their father, Raymond, and his brother, James. Disturbingly, just the year prior, one of Brittany's half-brother's biological father, Kevin Folsom, was sentenced to prison for having molested the six-year-old. He was later released in 2008. In 2000, authorities arrested Russell Toombs, a 41-year-old man living in St. Clair Shores for possession of child pornography. More than 2,000 images of child pornography were found on Toombs' computer, and in more than a dozen of them, there was a young girl who closely resembled Brittany. A still image of the young woman was circulated, though it was later determined to have been a young girl in Texas who was being abused by her parents. Authorities' prime suspect was Daniel Kevin Furlong, who bore a resemblance to the composite and was later convicted of murdering 11-year-old Jody Parrick in 2007. Furlong was known to be in the area at the time Brittany disappeared. In the 12 years since Brittany was taken, police have fielded more than 1,000 tips, but have failed to reveal the truth. They now believe that Brittany is likely deceased. Nineteen-year-old Angela Hammond was living in the small town of Clinton, Missouri. A fun-loving, kind, and caring young woman, Angela was described by many as a joy to be around. In 1990, Angela was dating 18-year-old Rob Schaefer, a star athlete at the local high school who had dreams of joining the military. Their relationship developed quickly and strongly, and the following year, in 1991, Angela told Rob that she was pregnant. Excited about the news, Rob proposed to Angela and she accepted. Soon, the young couple moved in together and began making plans for their forthcoming family. Rob was still planning to enlist, and Angela was attending college and helped support him. 
Both of them had gotten close to one another's respective families, and on April 4th, 1991, Angela and Rob attended a barbecue at her mother's home. Just after 9 p.m., the couple left as Rob had promised his parents he would come by and babysit his younger brother. Since it wouldn't be too long, Angela made plans to meet up with a friend and hang around town, and when Rob was done, he'd catch up with her. Angela and her friend hung out downtown for a few hours, and around 11.15 p.m., Angela dropped her friend off and was beginning to feel tired. Not wanting to be out all night, she stopped at a payphone in the parking lot of a grocery store. The couple couldn't afford a telephone at their own place, and so Angela stopped to call Rob and tell him that she was just going to go home for the night and for him to meet her there. She called Rob, and they ended up talking for approximately 30 minutes. Around 11.45 p.m., Angela quietly told Rob that a truck had driven by her multiple times and was making her nervous. She described the vehicle as an older, green and white Ford F-150 with a decal on the back window, depicting a fish jumping out of the water. The truck stopped and a man emerged, who Angela described as filthy looking. He entered the phone booth next to Angela, then returned to his truck and began using a flashlight as though he were searching for something. Rob heard Angela ask the man if he needed to use the phone, to which the man responded, no. Seconds later, Rob heard Angela scream, and he immediately ran to his car and rushed towards the payphone. As he drove, Rob passed a truck which fit the description Angela had given him. He witnessed a woman he believed to be Angela struggling with the driver and says she screamed out, Robbie. Rob quickly threw his vehicle into reverse, executing a U-turn and began chasing the truck. Unfortunately, in his haste and panic, Rob had severely damaged his car's transmission and could do little but watch in horror as his car ground to a halt and the truck disappeared into the darkness. Angela was never seen again, and there have been very few developments. In 2009, police explained that, due to new techniques, they were now in possession of DNA evidence, but the case has remained silent since. Daniel Jess Goldman, typically called Danny, was a 17-year-old young man attending high school in Miami and living in the town of Surfside with his parents in 1966. Danny was fascinated by electronics and often worked with them when he wasn't spending time with his girlfriend, Sharon. Danny's father, Aaron, was a contractor and his mother, Sally, was an interior designer. Danny would be turning 18 on March 29th, but sadly, there would be a search party in place of what the family had originally planned. On the morning of March 28th, Aaron and Sally were awakened at approximately 4.30 a.m. when an intruder, described as portly or husky, entered via an unlocked sliding glass door. The man, brandishing a handgun, referred to Aaron and Sally by their first names and demanded that they reveal the location of $10,000 that he believed was hidden in the home. When Aaron and Sally explained that there was no money hidden in the home, the intruder became angry and grabbed Danny, holding him at gunpoint. The gunman told the Goldmans he would be taking Danny with him, and they had until 6 p.m. to come up with $25,000 for ransom. He told them that if they didn't have it by 6 p.m., it would go up to $50,000. The abductor told the family he'd call them between 6 and 7 p.m., but he never did. Danny was never seen again, nor was his abductor ever identified. For years, the Miami police and the FBI worked to try and unravel this overwhelming mystery, but nothing was ever found. While the case had shocked the nation and made headlines around the world, over the years it began to fade, and by the mid-2000s, there was hardly a whisper of Danny, the gunman, or what may have happened that spring day in the south of Florida. In 2012, some 46 years later, residents of Surfside organized with a lawyer and former mayor, Paul Novak, to reinvestigate the case in an attempt to breathe life back into it. 
It was through their hard work that new information was brought to light. New documents discovered and details of the case, which had previously been hidden, were finally revealed. In a shocking discovery, it was made public that prior to his son's abduction, Aaron Goldman had been meeting with federal agents regarding a mafia-led loan scheme and money laundering being run through the Five Points Bank, where he was a member of the board of directors. The loan scheme was tied to such infamous names as Jimmy Hoffa, Meyer Lansky, and Santo Traficante, as well as numerous local officials and residents who had friends in powerful places. On Thursday, March 24th, the investigation was presented to a federal grand jury as a case for conspiracy and racketeering. Danny would be abducted just four days later on Monday. Following the kidnapping, 19 indictments were doled out, though they never came close to any of the major figures at the top. In another twist, the new investigation discovered that the very sheriff's department assigned to the case had ties to the men who may have planned the abduction. It has since been suggested that Danny was abducted by a two-person team, being that of George Defias and Joe Cacciatore, both of whom worked in the Traficante organization. In fact, Defias' fingerprint was recovered from the sliding glass door during the initial investigation, though it was never followed up on. Investigators now believe Danny was murdered in Miami, taken out into the Gulf, dismembered, and tossed overboard. Other names implicated were Wally Jefferson, a former police officer who owned the boat, Charles Lloyd, a bootlegger, and David Hellman, then acting chief of intelligence for the Miami-Dade Sheriff's Department. Danny's girlfriend at the time of his abduction would later marry Wally Jefferson, and her father may have been the man who told the abductors about money possibly being in the home. While much has been revealed, justice has not yet been served, and the full story of what became of Danny, who else was involved, and why they chose to murder a 17-year-old rather than the man who was threatening their illegal operation, remains a mystery. If you're interested in learning more about the abductions of Angela Hammond or Daniel Jess Goldman, please click on their episodes available in full length here.